Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar with the Feline Friends Academy titled Tales of Feline Fangs uh, with Rachel Perry. This is the, the final webinar in the series, and we really do hope you've uh, enjoyed the series uh, in association with Feline Friends Academy and the webinar vet. If you haven't uh, seen any of the other webinars in this series, the recordings are available on YouTube if you search for the Feline Friends Academy. There's some excellent uh, webinars on some very interesting topics on there. Uh, there will be a survey posted soon uh, in regards to the series as a whole. And if we can get your feedback, that'll be really amazing uh, and see what sort of topics that you'd like to see in the future. On to tonight's webinar with Rachel Perry. Rachel graduated as a veterinary surgeon from Edinburgh University in 1997 and entered small animal practice. She soon develops an interest in small animal dentistry. Since 2010, her practice has been limited to small animal dentistry and oral surgery, and she provides first opinion and referral services in the southeast. In 2016, she passed the European Veterinary Dental College Board examination to become diplomat and European veterinary specialist in veterinary dentistry. She was granted RCVS specialist status in 2017. Rachel has lectured nationally and internationally and published original research, review articles in journals, textbooks, and is regularly involved in online and in-house teaching for nurses and vets across the country. The main species she treats are cats and dogs, but she has also treated tigers, cheetahs, bears, leopards, marmosets, fossas, and vicuñas. So a very uh, broad spectrum of animals. So without further ado, I shall now pass over to Rachel uh, for tonight's webinar. Thanks, Paul, and thank you very much to the Feline Friends Academy for asking me to present this topic. Um, it's a topic very close to my heart. Um, I, I love cats and I love working on them and, and making their lives better for sorting their teeth out. And it's lovely of you to join me tonight. Uh, for those of you that are sitting inside listening to me, well done. It's a beautiful sunny evening here where I live, so well, well done. It, it tells me, though, how much we all love our cats and how we want to do the best for them. Um, thank you also to the webinar vet for facilitating this and getting this message um, you know, over, over the world and to, to as many people as possible. So Paul already said uh, my journey, my professional journey started off as a vet um, and I was very happy being a vet for a number of years and my interest in dentistry really was sparked um, from an unfortunate lack of training in dentistry at veterinary school and that's still unfortunately uh, fairly true to, to this day that the training that, that veterinary students get is, is um, certainly not as much as a human dentist would get over five years um, so it does rely on people like myself going out there to, to train vets to do um, a better job with dentistry. So my journey really was sparked from not having very much knowledge about dentistry in animals and then when I started um, learning about it properly and learning how to do it well um, I could see a big difference in my patients I could see how much better they were for having uh, their teeth sorted and the interesting thing about animals is that they really don't tell us when they have toothaches so we do have to rely on our vets and our veterinary nurses to detect problems and advise us on the best course of action. I do have two cats myself. Uh, these two keep me busy and entertained on a daily basis. Um, I rescued them from one of the hospitals where I work. They were, they were strays and um, they give me joy every day. I love them to pieces. Now, just to make sure you're all paying attention, um, as Paul mentioned in the introduction, I have treated some very unusual species. And here is a very unusual cat-like creature that I would like you to have a look at the photos of and see if you can identify what species it is. So I'll give you a few moments to look at those amazing teeth and those amazing feet. So teeth are amazing. When you think about the variety of teeth that not only humans have, but animals have, and they're all, designed to do very, very specific things. Um, and the, the, the variety of teeth that animals have really is quite astounding. But the amazing thing is that the structure of teeth is, is generally very, very similar, whether it's a tusk of an elephant, a shark tooth, um, that's the vicuña that you can see there top right with a, a towel over its head. Um, or the walrus there that's had some, some metal crowns placed on to help uh, stop the wearing down of those um, those tusks from, from uh, basically 
the way walruses eat is they kind of uh, shuffle around on the, the seabed to, to get food. They, they scrape around to, to get the food to come up. Um, so in captivity, they can start to wear those, those tusks down. But teeth are really incredible. Um, I've met, I've, uh, Paul mentioned I've treated some big cats. Here is a, a cheetah on the left and a snow leopard on the right. And when you look at the teeth, um, they are very, very similar to one another. And what's even more amazing, you, you know, you look at these animals, they're, they're incredible creatures. But when you compare them to the cats that we have at home, um, hopefully none of you have got a cheetah or a, a snow leopard at home. Um, when we compare them to the cats that we have at home, the teeth are virtually identical. They're just obviously miniaturized in our cats. And cat teeth really are very, very specialized. Um, they're specialized to capture their prey, whether it's mice or birds or insects, reptiles, capture the prey, kill it, and obviously we're all used to that if we're cat owners. <laughs> My cat is going through a, a terrible phase of, of bringing in mice um, uh, and just kind of playing with them. The next thing that cats should do, of course, when they when they kill their prey is to, to chop it into smaller pieces and then swallow it. But we all know that domestic cats actually enjoy the thrill of, you know, hunting and chasing and, and doing things like that. Compared to dogs, dogs can do quite a bit of grinding movement with their jaws, with their teeth. Uh, they have molar teeth that are designed to do some grinding. Um, a bit like our molar teeth. Now, cats do have molars, but they're not designed to do any grinding at all. They literally are designed to do chopping work, and that's it. And interestingly, the joint of the jaw, the what we call the temporomandibular joint, or TMJ, in cats can only move up and down. Whereas in us, if you move your lower jaw, you can move it from the left to the right. Dogs can also do that to a certain extent, but the jaw in the cat is really designed to be a proper hinge. It just goes up and down. So cats are very specialized um, in, in capturing prey and, and killing that prey in the most effective way possible. So they have 30 teeth, um, four, four canines, the four fangs that you can see uh, are the big ones. Um, and then they have premolars and molars to um, as I say, to, to sort of chop up food. Um, and then the very, very small teeth at the front that you can see in the middle there are called the incisors. And those are kind of a big a grooming uh, tool, really. If, you, if you've got an itch and you've got a flea, the incisors are going to be the teeth that are going to help you catch that flea. Kittens have slightly less teeth because they don't have any molars, but the shape and size is, is kind of the same. Um, and again, they're designed to do very, very similar things. The tongue is amazing. I'm sure we've all been licked by our cats at some point, and it feels very, very rough, like sandpaper. And the tongue in the cat is a very, very specialized um, uh, part of the body that's designed to be a big, giant flea comb. If you ever get the chance to look at your cat's tongue closely when it perhaps yawns at you, um, you will see these little projections on the surface of the tongue that are very uh, stiff and rough, called papillae. They point backwards, um, and so when the, the cat grooms itself, it's a very, very efficient grooming tool. However, as I mentioned at the start, cats don't tend to tell us when they've got toothache. They certainly don't stop eating. Um, they don't stop their normal behaviors. And this is my cat, Mooks. Um, he's only 18 months old, bless him. And I was brushing his teeth uh, a few weeks ago. I try to brush their teeth regularly. And I've introduced them to it from a young age. So they, they tolerate it. I wouldn't say they enjoy it, but they do tolerate it without too much stress. Um, and I was brushing his teeth a few weeks ago and sadly noticed that he had broken one of his canine teeth. And hopefully you can see there the one on his left or the right as you're looking at it is shorter than the one on the other side. Um, so I had a good look at it and I could tell that he'd gone right through to the middle of the tooth, which is what we call the pulp which is where all the nerves and blood vessels are in the tooth. The most likely way he's done this is uh, when cats jump down off high objects, fences or, or sheds, things like that. Sometimes they misjudge the distance. And when they land, they kind of do a little bit of a face plant. They sort of knock their face into the floor, into the ground, and that can chip those upper canine teeth like that. He certainly didn't tell me that he was sore. He carried on eating as normal. He went outside as normal. He really didn't demonstrate anything to alert me to it. So if I had not been brushing his teeth, I perhaps would not have noticed this at all. But I knew it needed treatment because I could see that it had damaged the tooth sufficiently to um, 
include the, the nerves inside the tooth. So I did go ahead and, and treat it. And I was able to save the tooth by doing what we call a root canal therapy, which is um, a, a treatment where we remove the diseased pulp and then we put our own inert rubber-based cement inside the tooth to, to preserve it. So this was him under the general anaesthetic and I'm using uh, what's called an explorer probe just to feel the end of that tooth there. You can see that it's starting to bleed. So that tells me that that pulp is definitely involved in that tooth. So they have the same nerves as we have. So he undoubtedly would have been feeling discomfort with that tooth, but outwardly was certainly not demonstrating that at all. So they do behave very normally. They, they eat, they go out, do their normal routine, uh, they sleep, you know, so it can be very difficult to tell. So we really must rely on our vets to detect the problem. So um, when you go for an annual checkup or when you go for a booster vaccination, your vet should, you know, do a, a mouth check at the same time as the rest of the physical examination. Um, and they are very well trained at detecting problems in, in cat's mouths. And Dental problems are very common, so it's not unusual um, as cats get to sort of the age of four, five, six, seven, eight, that your vet may say, well, there's this or that or the other, um, and this needs addressing. So the main dental problems that cats seem to suffer with, apart from obviously broken teeth, which um, is, is not uncommon, unfortunately, but gum disease is perhaps one of the most common diseases, both in dogs and cats. It's probably the number two dental disease in people, uh, the number one is, is caries or, or cavities because we like sugary drinks and um, things like that. But in dogs and cats, probably the number one uh, disease that our pets are faced with um, is gum disease. And the proper name for that is periodontal disease. And there's two main forms of that. The, um, the, the gingivitis is the first stage, and then that can progress onto a more serious form. But it's essentially caused by the buildup of bacteria on the teeth, um, and we call that plaque. And it's a very clever community of many hundreds of species of bacteria that form what's called a biofilm. Um, and that biofilm is very resistant to things like antibiotics. Um, and the best way to remove a biofilm is actually physical scrubbing. So that's why we go to the bathroom cabinet twice a day, hopefully, take a toothbrush out, use some toothpaste and brush our teeth. That is the best way still of physically removing those plaque bacteria that build upon our teeth naturally. What's interesting about the disease is it's not just the bacteria that drive the disease, but it's how our bodies, how our immune systems respond to those bacteria in the mouth. So we send all the natural um, immune response systems into, into play, so antibodies, other inflammatory cells. And we can end up with what's effectively a battleground in the mouth. You have the plaque bacteria there, you have the body's immune system, the body's defense is trying to control those bacteria, and things get damaged in the way. So the gums can get damaged, the supporting bone around the teeth can also get damaged. Now tartar is, is that brown, yellowy, um, thick material, a bit like cement that can build upon teeth over time. And effectively all it is, is is plaque bacteria that has not been removed and it mineralizes. So it takes in uh, minerals, calcium phosphate from saliva, um, and it forms that hard cement-like material on the tooth. And tartar in itself doesn't actually fuel the disease it just attracts more plaque bacteria because it's a very rough surface and the plaque bacteria like a, a nice rough sticky surface to stick to so it does fuel the disease by um, uh, attracting more of the plaque bacteria so the stages of, of gum disease or periodontal disease the first stage is when we get inflammation of the gums and that's called gingivitis so we may see that as a redness or reddening of the, the gums initially where they attach to the tooth. So you may see that sort of red line along the, the, the teeth line there. And if that isn't controlled, if we don't do anything about that, the disease can certainly progress onto the more destructive stage of the disease, which we call periodontitis. And that's where she starts to destroy the attachment of the tooth tooth in the jawbone. So the bone that is supporting the tooth starts to be destroyed and the ligament that's also holding the tooth in the socket 
that gets destroyed as well. So we end up with these so-called pockets around teeth and, and some of you may have been to the dentist yourself and, and, and been told that you've got a pocket around a tooth. And effectively this is what's happening, the, the gum should attach around the tooth a bit like um, a collar of a shirt that's done up right to the top. It should attach around the tooth just like that. But with the advancement of gum disease we get a loosening of that gum attachment. So ultimately we can end up with loose teeth and then eventually the tooth would be lost from the mouth. Now, gingivitis itself is reversible. They did some studies in the 1960s on gullible uh, dental students that volunteered to stop brushing their teeth for a week. Um, you can imagine what their mouths were like after a week of not brushing their teeth. Pretty stinky, probably bleeding gums, and certainly would have been very, very smelly. But interestingly, when they started brushing their teeth again and, and controlled the plaque levels, the gums returned to normal health. So we know that the gingivitis stage is reversible. Once we get to the periodontitis stage, however, and we've got bone loss, that essentially becomes irreversible. Now, dentists that treat human teeth can certainly do some regenerative um, things. There are ways to regenerate bone in our mouths. If we are very good at um, brushing our own teeth and doing all the flossing and the interdental brushes that we're, we're told to. But a, a human dentist would certainly not attempt that kind of regeneration of bone in our mouths unless we were very, 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 very good at our hygiene at home with our tooth brushing and flossing, etc. So you can imagine in cats, although those techniques are possible um, in, in specialist hands, there are perhaps limited cases where we may be able to offer that to, to feline patients. So what are the signs that you might see at home? Well, really, the first sign is bad breath. Cats should not have bad breath. There should be no smell to their, to their mouth. So when they come and yawn in your face, you don't want to be, you know, turning your head away um, because it smells so bad. That really is the first sign of um, of periodontal disease and it's a sign that the bacteria are building up in the mouth and they're producing certain compounds called volatile sulfur compounds that give that really typical bad breath smell. The other thing that you may see perhaps while the cat is doing that yawning in your face as they like to do you may see that reddening of the gums. In dogs, if any of you have dogs, if they like chewing on toys, you may see some blood accumulating on toys or chews. Cats don't tend to sort of, you know, play with toys so much that they, they, you'll, you'll notice blood on the toys. But if you have got any of these small little, you know, kickaroos or, or fish toys and you're noticing blood on that, then it could be the mouth, could be the gums that are bleeding. We may even see bleeding gums and for you and I if we go to the sink at night and brush our teeth and spit out and there is blood it certainly is a sign that we could have some gingivitis in our mouths. Um, as the disease progresses we may even start to see receding gums as well. Now cats suffer from this problem called tooth resorption. It used to be called um, FORL which is an acronym for a very wordy feline odontoclastive sorry, odontoclastic resorptive lesions. We're now just kind of referring to it as tooth resorption, but it's a very common problem in feline teeth. And studies suggest that up to two thirds of cats can suffer from this at some point in their lives. And it's not just cats that get it. People get it, dogs get it, uh, monkeys get it, dolphins get it. So it is a process that any tooth can undergo. And it's effectively where the body decides it's going to resorb or destroy the tooth. So we can end up with not only destruction of the root of the tooth, which is holding uh, the tooth in place, but that can head up towards the crown of the tooth. And it can eventually end up exposing those nerves inside the tooth in that pulp area. So it can be very, very painful. Unfortunately, we don't know what causes it. It's still an unknown for us, which is quite frustrating. And I hope that by the end of my career, somebody with a lot of brains has managed to work this out because if, you know, if you've got a cat at home and you've suffered or your cat has suffered from this, you'll know how, how terrible it can be. There seems to be two main types and it can be very difficult to differentiate the two types unless you have x-rays. When you look at these teeth, they look very similar on both sides. You know, there's obvious um, damage to that crown area of the tooth by the gum there. There's an obvious, you know, defect in the 
covering layer of the tooth, the enamel. But when we look at the x-rays on the left there, in type one, the roots are pretty much still intact. Uh, the ligament that holds the tooth in place in the jaw appears as a black line around each of those roots. And the areas of absorption also appear as a sort of a black, um, black pattern within the tooth. And then the roots you can see are, are here. In the other type, the tooth effectively disappears. So it's completely resorbed by the body and then placed by the surrounding bone. So effectively the tooth is, is disappearing. And the treatment is very different for these two types. With this type on the left, type one, we have to do a full extraction of these roots to get any remaining pulp out of the body so it's not painful. With this type, because the tooth has already, or the root has already effectively gone, we simply need to do what's called um, a, a crown amputation or coronectomy, where we remove what is left of the crown of the tooth and then we stitch the gum over this area here. So generally with, with this problem, again, cats don't tend to stop eating. They may chew slightly differently if they've got discomfort in their mouths. So you may notice perhaps that they're going off wet food and will only eat dry food or vice versa. They may only chew on one side of the mouth um, or they may be more hesitant when they eat. Um, and some cats, if they have toothache, just don't want to chew at all. So what they may do is actually gulp their food down. So they look like they've got a tremendous appetite but then, of course, because they're eating quickly and they're not chewing properly, they may then go and um, sort of sick it up, sick up their breakfast or dinner behind the sofa. So that eating very, very quickly can sometimes be an indicator for us as vets that there may be some, some pain in that mouth. Now, to do a full assessment with our patients, with my patients, I need them fully anaesthetized. I need a full general anaesthetic. I can't just sedate them. I really do need them under a full general anaesthetic. So this is where the whole team in the veterinary clinic um, comes into play. I need a good team of, of veterinary nurses around me to help with the anaesthetic. And we use all the same um, anaesthetic equipment as human doctors, human anaesthetists would use. So, you know, anaesthetic machines giving anaesthetic gases and oxygen, um, machines that are reading ECG and heart rate and breathing rate and all the sort of BP monitors that you see on casualty and those kind of programs. But it is really the only way that we can examine their mouths properly and also of course so that they can't feel anything while we're doing it. We don't want to cause any discomfort either when we're assessing the teeth or taking x-rays or then treating them. We use lots of drugs to help uh, the, the cat not remember anything which is great not feel any pain um, and also they're very uh, they're the same as the drugs that human anesthetists would use so we make anesthesia as safe as we possibly can so once we get our patient anesthetized then we can do a more thorough assessment and that involves using a periodontal probe, which you can see in these two pictures, to actually assess the tooth more thoroughly. So we're going to check for those pockets around the teeth. We're going to check for signs of bone loss. And we certainly wouldn't be able to do this in, a, in, a, in an awake cat. We then can take x-rays, um, and that gives us the full picture of what's going on beneath the gum line in that root area. And then we can perform our treatment. And treatment might involve scaling and polishing, just like you would have uh, with the hygienist. We would also then be able to clean underneath the gum line. We use special instruments to get underneath the gum line to clean the root surface. Um, and if we need to, then we can perform extractions at the same time. And you can see in this cat that's had to have both of its lower canines extracted. We use very fine, delicate stitches to close the area so there's no holes to get food trapped in or anything like that. And that allows the mouth to heal very, very quickly. So I anticipate my patients to be waking up very quickly, wanting to eat as soon as possible, going home the same day, and then pretty much getting back to normal within, within a few days and certainly eating normally, you know, very, very quickly. And it is really important that your vet has x-rays and, and uses them. It can be very difficult to make an accurate diagnosis or perform the correct treatment if you don't take x-rays. Um, and not every veterinary practice uh, has access to dental x-rays. The numbers are changing. More and more practices are investing in it. 
um, but not every practice um, has it. So they do the best they can without um, access to dental radiography. And you can see uh, in this cat, uh, the tooth on the left of your screen, so the cat's right tooth looks very, very badly diseased. You can see all that gum has kind of grown up and over that tooth, but the opposite tooth looks relatively healthy. But when we take the x-ray, um, the x-ray of this cat is on the left and a normal cat is on the right there. So again, on the normal cat, you can see the pulp on the inside is that black line. The ligament on the outside is also the black line around the root. That's what a healthy normal tooth should look like. And in this cat, you really can't make out the ligament space at all. You can't make out the pulp. But both teeth are virtually at the similar stage of disease. So both of these teeth would need treatment. And the treatment would be that what we call crown amputation, where we literally just remove the crown and then stitch the gum over the top there. So how can we help to keep teeth healthy? Well, I did mention at the start that I brush my cat's teeth. Um, if you do want to start tooth brushing, the earlier the better. So with kittens, if you can get them used to the concept of a young age, that's ideal. It can be quite hard to introduce um, tooth brushing to a middle-aged or older cat. Cats like their routine and they don't like uh, weird things in, the, in their life. Um, and it's also important that that perhaps your vet checks the teeth before you attempt to start tooth brushing because if there is a painful tooth there you certainly don't want to go uh, putting a toothbrush in there if the cat's already a bit sore. So it is the gold standard, um, it's the gold standard for people and it's certainly the gold standard for cats and dogs in terms of controlling gum disease. Um, as I mentioned tooth resorption we still don't know really what causes it. Um, gum disease is linked to the first type of tooth resorption but the second type, we genuinely don't know what causes it. So unfortunately, even if you are able to brush your cat's teeth regularly, they may still get tooth resorption, which is a little bit frustrating. So aim, if you're going to do it, aim for once a day. Um, and the key thing is to ensure routine so that you always do it at the same time of day so the cat gets used to it. And then praise and reward. Cats can be taught to do things by rewarding them with treats. So they always get a treat afterwards and then they perhaps get their dinner or their breakfast. It's very important that you use a pet friendly toothpaste. Don't be tempted to use a human one. Human ones taste of mint, which cats don't really like, um, and human ones, of course, have fluoride in, but we know to spit the toothpaste out so we don't swallow all the fluoride, but of course, cats don't know that. And apparently, we like toothpaste that froth up when we brush our teeth, but cats certainly would not appreciate anything that foamed up in their mouth. So pet toothpaste don't have fluoride, and they won't foam when you use them. They're more like a sticky, a sticky paste. The toothbrush really just needs to be the right say, size and shape that you can actually get access into the mouth. Um, I've had a lot of success with these brushes here. These are from a Swedish company called Accessia. Um, but really any, any child's toothbrush from the supermarket would, would work just as well. And you can also get the little finger training toothbrushes as well, which are, are fairly good for getting cats used to the, the concept. So here's a video of, of Eric having his teeth brushed. You can see he likes the paste. He's got his Winnie the Pooh, Boo, Winnie the Pooh toothbrush. And I'm just supporting his head uh, over the top there and then I'm cuddling him towards me. And he certainly doesn't find this stressful at all. He quite likes it. And I'm just parting the lips there, lifting the lips so I can see the teeth, just using a circular motion there whilst brushing those teeth. It is quite challenging to brush another either person's teeth or another animal's teeth. It takes quite a bit of skill um, and is very difficult sometimes to know exactly how much pressure you're, you're applying. Um, but certainly with kittens, if you can get them used to it, um, that's much easier. Cats like having their face stroked, you know, their cheeks. So you can start off by using the toothbrush really as a grooming, um, a grooming tool just to kind of groom their face, groom their cheeks along their lips so they get used to the concept of having a, a toothbrush near their face and mouth. Now diets can help, dental specific diets, if you're going to use anything to try and help uh, the, the, the dental health, then it does need to be a dental specific diet. You can't just feed a, a regular dry food and, and expect that to help. Um, the dental specific diets, uh, the kibble size is slightly bigger. 
um, and some of them will have added ingredients to help uh, slow down the, the plaque and, and tar to build up. Um, again, you need to start these early enough in the cat's life for them really to make a difference. And there is this uh, seal that you can look for on um, treats and chews and foods, the VOHC seal. And um, this is the so-called Veterinary Oral Health Council, uh, which will basically look at the claims made by food and treat manufacturers when they say it reduces plaque or it reduces tartar. They will look at those claims in a scientific way. They will look at the evidence um, and they will decide whether the product meets the, their claims, basically. So that can be something to look out for if you are buying anything. So as I mentioned, dry food per se is not protective, but equally wet food doesn't cause the disease. Um, and this was the cheetah that I showed you at the start. This was fed a, a very natural diet. Um, and this cheetah has gingivitis. This cheetah has, you know, um, periodontal disease. So even feeding a natural um, meat-based diet, this, I think this cheetah was on rabbits, this is not protecting this, this cheetah from getting gum disease. So there are some treats that you can try. Uh, so the Dentabites have the VOHC seal and they're very tasty. The problem with treats is that cat teeth are not designed to do much chewing. Um, as I mentioned at the very start, cat teeth are designed to capture your prey, kill your prey, chop it into small pieces and then and they go. So cats are not designed to spend a long time chewing anything basically. So it is very difficult to try and expect a, a treat to help a huge amount with um, dental health but th it's something it's something to consider so here we are at the end of my talk um, i hope it's been interesting for you and if any of you recognize this stunning creature it is a fossa which is a cat-like creature and they struggled for a long time to identify how to classify it was it a dog was it a cat was it something in between um, so it's a bit like a, a civet or a mongoose that kind of animal um, and the fossa is found in Madagascar and it has these amazing forearms that allows it to climb trees and then actually catch lemurs which is its uh, preferred food source so quite a stunning creature but the teeth you can see are very cat-like so thank you very much for listening I do appreciate you tuning in to listen to me I hope it's been beneficial um, thank you once again to the Feline Friends Academy and of course Webinar Vet thank you very much Rachel that was very very informative lots of uh, lots of great information handy information as well and practical advice uh, everyone who's, uh, who's online with us, if you have any questions, uh, Rachel's agreed to stay around for a few minutes and to answer a few of them uh, if, if you have any. So if you hover your mouse over your screen, you should get a, a small uh, box appear with a Q&A option. If you click on that and submit any questions, uh, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, so Rachel, the first question we have, uh, a little bit more technical, so perhaps someone with a, a veterinary or a scientific background. Uh, what suture material do you use for gum suturing and interrupted or continuous? Um, so in animals, we use a dissolvable suture, so not a, a permanent suture that then needs to be removed. Um, so something um, like monocryl, uh, which doesn't last very long, but it basically holds the gums in place while they heal. Um, and I tend to stick with a simple interrupted, which basically means a series of single sutures ra rather than a sort of a blanket type stitch. Um, the reason I do simple interrupted is that if one of the stitches breaks because the cat decides to start licking it with its tongue, then the whole suture line won't then break down if you've done a simple continuous. Excellent, thank you. And do you use methadone or buprenorphine in, in pre-med? I've read that the latter is just as good as the former for analgesia. Um, I would disagree with that, actually. Um, uh, I prefer a, a pure mu agonist, so um, I would always use methadone. Um, I think buprenorphine has a good place in post-operative analgesia, particularly because you can give it to the cat, obviously, orally. Wonderful, thank you, Caroline. I hope that's uh, answered your question. Uh, have a question here uh, well I have comments actually from Nicola who said thank you really interesting webinar great to see dentabites can help a bit as they're one of my cat's favorites oh good <laughs> um, Adam has asked uh, is there any point in brushing the teeth twice a week or must it be every day as mitre will tolerate that but not every day 
That's a great question. A lot of people ask me that. The research has shown that once a week is as good as doing nothing. So if you're brushing once a week, I would say try and increase that frequency. And probably every other day is going to be better than not at all. Um, once we're getting to sort of every three days or twice a week, there's probably limited benefit. It's a bit like brushing our own teeth twice a week. We probably would still have fairly pongy breath if we did that so try and aim for every other day but if you do it daily then at least you know i've got to do it at this time every day and then it becomes in your routine as much as the cat's routine yes very good point there and i imagine as as you start building that up of course the cat will get more used to it oh absolutely cats are creatures of a complete habit um, and if they know it's going to happen then that's it they just accept it you know they don't get too too stressed about it yeah, of course. Um, interesting question here from Hester. Does crunching mice on a regular basis help clean teeth at all? Well, that is a very interesting question. And one of my colleagues who is a veterinary dentist in Australia did a, a really interesting research paper on this very thing. He looked at a feral population of cats that were wild, that were eating mice and birds and lizards, etc. And he compared the health of their teeth to domesticated cats that were eating a mix of dry food and wet food. And what he found was that the level of tartar in the wild feral cats was, was less. So there was less tartar, the teeth looked cleaner. But when he looked more closely for evidence of actual periodontal disease, the level was the same in the two different populations. So I don't think we can say that eating mice, unfortunately, is protective for um, periodontal disease. So wild cats get periodontal disease. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Um, some some very positive comments here, some wonderful feedback. Uh, thank you so much. Best presentation yet, which is always uh, nice to hear. Um, we have some more questions coming through. So we'll just go through a few of these now. Um, a very interesting uh, question here, actually. I've noticed more adverts appearing offering ultrasonic dental cleaning services for pets by lay people and clearly without anesthesia. What are your thoughts on, on that? I think if they're offering a tooth brushing service, then that's one thing. If they're offering this is all you need and you don't need to see your vet, then I'm concerned about that. And actually there is a, a grooming parlor where I live that is offering exactly that. They're saying, don't go to your vet, just come and, and see us. Um, and in the United States, there's a big problem with so-called anesthesia free dental cleanings and um, pet, uh, pet owners are you know, going to grooming parlors, taking their dogs or their cats and thinking that they're doing the best for their pets by avoiding the anesthetic. But the disease is still there. The teeth just look very clean because they've had a hand scale, but the disease is happening underneath the gum line and it's impossible for us to get to that with the patient awake. So unfortunately the disease progresses despite the teeth looking lovely and white. And um, we're seeing a lot of patients coming in at the end stages of diseases and they've got terrible mouths. Um, so yes, it's fine if you consider it as a tooth brushing service, but it shouldn't replace the treatment that your vet's able to offer. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting uh, question here, just touching on anesthesia as well. What are your recommendations for cats with uh, CKD that are not easily put under anesthesia? Um, well, it depends what stage of CKD you're talking about. And there's been quite a few papers recently that have suggested that periodontal disease is a risk factor for K CKD. So in the early stages of uh, chronic kidney disease, if we're not addressing their periodontal disease, then it will make the chronic kidney disease worse. So um, I think in a properly managed anaesthetic, general anaesthetic, it is still safe to anaesthetize these patients um, and sort their teeth out. And at the end of the day, if they've got painful teeth, it's an ethical obligation for us to attempt to alleviate that. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions uh, here about gingivitis. Uh, so what do you think about using class four laser to treat gingivitis? I have no immediate um, experience of it and I'd like to see some evidence based research to show that it's helpful in dogs and cats. And if anyone can send me any links, I'll be thrilled mm -hmm. to, to read it, but no personal experience of using it. Okay, thank you. Um, and the other question, um, so uh, saying uh, if the antibiotic is less effective to treat gingivitis, what's the first line of treatment that we can do in cats? So 
it's always <coughs> excuse me physical physical removal so that may be um, a professional cleaning at your vets uh, scaling polishing and then physical removal at home ideally toothbrushing or using some of the the dental diets and treats but they're never going to be as good as toothbrushing so some cats will need to go to the vet regularly for a professional cleaning i mean i brush my teeth fairly religiously as you can imagine and i floss and i do all that i should do but i still have to see my hygienist every six months because there are areas in my own mouth that i can't reach effectively so Yes, yeah, of course. Uh, which actually ties into a question here from Hester's uh, saying, is it a good idea to uh, get a specialist, uh, a cat tooth vet or a cat uh, dentist specialist to check yearly rather than a normal vet? And should we have the teeth x-rayed regularly? Uh, that's, that's two good questions there. Um, I think when any vet is doing any kind of dental treatment on a dog or a cat, it's always worth getting x-rays um, because we pick up so many more problems if we do that. Um, and the, the decision about whether to see a specialist dentist or not really is your, your decision. If you feel that you want your cat to be treated by a specialist dentist, then you just need to ask your vet to refer you to one and they will sort it out. It's normal practice. Vets are used to doing that. So really not a problem. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Ina's asking uh, or, or talking about a particular product. I don't know if you're aware of this. It's a liquid that you can put into the cat's water that helps with, uh, with teeth cleaning. Have you heard of that? There are a few out there. There's one um, that has got some fairly limited evidence as to its efficacy. Um, and then until there's better evidence out there, I'm not um, happy to recommend it on a regular basis, unfortunately. Yes. And uh, for for the, the lay person or just the, the average pet owner, where would you suggest sort of looking for information about the efficacy of, of treatments and things like this? Well, instead of going to Google. Um, if you go to Google Scholar instead, um, it actually gives you scientific evidence rather than people's opinions on forums and things like that. So go to Google Scholar instead and then you can research and actually find some, some scientific evidence to help you answer your question. Yeah, that's great. I think it is a little bit uh, more difficult than it used to be to find uh, Google Scholar now because they have so many uh, different products on their page but i think it's just <laughs> dot google it's uh, dot yeah. dot co uk so it should be relatively easy to find or if you just google google scholar i guess if you just put scholar into the google bar it will normally bring it up for you so excellent um i have a comment here um my own cat has ibd uh, pregnant care for the ibd it seems has cured her gingivitis but her teeth are weakened by the amount of time uh, she she vomits. Is there anything that could help strengthen her teeth? Um, that's an interesting one. It may be that she's getting resorption, which is completely separate to the IBD and the and the vomiting. Um, I know that in people that vomit a lot, they get acid erosion to their teeth. However, I'm not aware of that being described in animals, but that is an interesting concept. Um, but it may be that she's actually undergoing a different disease process. But we don't really regularly use fluoride in dogs or cats to strengthen their teeth because that's mostly as a protectant for caries or cavities in people. Cats don't get caries. Or we, we just simply have not you know uh, recognized it in them and dogs get caries but very very rarely so it certainly isn't a big problem so we don't tend to use fluoride um, regularly in the treatment of dogs or cats perfect thank you very much uh, monica's asking uh, for a little bit more information uh, about uh, f-o-r-l the uh, i'm not going to attempt to, to say <laughs> i'd only mess it up um is, could you give us just a, a touch more information sort of why where what to do as I said, there's two main types. Um, in the first type, that seems to be associated with the inflammation seen in gum disease. So maybe the inflammation drives that, but it effectively ends up with the destruction of the tooth substance. And the treatment of that, unfortunately, is extraction of the tooth. There is no kind of restoration or filling that we can do to, to protect it. Um, and in the other type, which we genuinely do not know what causes it, um, it just seems to happen in middle aged to older cats. And as I mentioned, up to two thirds of cats will get it at some point in their lives. Um, the treatment, again, is, is getting rid of what is left of the tooth, the sort of the, the crown amputation. And there's nothing that we can do to stop it from happening 
because we don't know what causes it. So it's a very frustrating problem, unfortunately. Yes, very much so. Um, just a couple more questions coming in then. I'm conscious that uh, we have already run over, so we'll go for you th through a few more, if that's okay, just a couple more. Uh, Leon is just asking, what's the name of the, the Swedish uh, toothbrush, please, that you mentioned? So it's at Accessia. The company is called A -C, C E. I think it's S I A. Excellent. Um, sure, it should be uh, relatively easy to find, I guess, on on different on various uh, pet websites. Pet dungeons. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, just uh, the final one then. Um, what's your opinion on? Tramisin, the clone injection on the gum to treat the gingivitis. I'm sure I said that wrong. I do apologize. So a steroid paste or? It doesn't say. Um, again, I'm, I'm wary of using any kind of steroids in cats unless absolutely necessary. So um, I would prefer the treatment that looks at removing the, removing the plaque um, rather than trying to sort of suppress the immune system. So I wouldn't reach for that as a first line treatment. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks once again, uh, Rachel, for hanging around as well and answering uh, all the questions for us. You're very welcome. Excellent talk. Um, to all the attendees listening, we hope you've enjoyed the series. Please do look out for the, the survey that will be coming around shortly uh, over the next uh, few days or the next week. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, we hope to see you on another webinar soon. Thank you again, everyone. Good night. Bye.